Soprano saxophonist and flutist Jane Bunette was born and lives in Toronto and has received many major Canadian awards, including the Order of Canada, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal, the Premier's Award for Excellence, and four Juno Awards. She's an amorist to perform at UMass with her band Makeke. With Makeke, Bunette has created something new and phenomenal. What started out five years ago as a project to record and mentor young, brilliant Cuban female musicians has become one of the top groups on the North American jazz scene. In the last couple of years, they have played major jazz festivals like Newport and Monterey, been featured on NPR's Jazz Night in America, were nominated for a Grammy Award for their latest release, Odara, and voted as one of the top 10 jazz groups in Downbeat Magazine's Critics Poll. It's a great honor to have Jane Brunette here in Thank Amherst you. with great us. Thank you, great to be here. So Jane, I wanted to talk about uh, your early career and serendipity, because you had a, a, a major injury. You grew up uh, playing piano in the cla European classical tradition and were quite far along on that path mm -hmm. and then had a serious injury and that changed your whole trajectory mm -hmm. of, of your musical career. So I want you to talk a little bit about the role of luck and serendipity mm -hmm. and chance uh, and, and how it got you where you are today. Hmm. Well, um, my, my background, my, my parents, uh, weren't musicians, um, but they were very, uh, we had a, you know, very lively, creative um, household. Um, I'm the youngest of three kids, and there's a seven-year difference pretty much between the, all, the three of us being the youngest. Um, so the, the, the arts were always very encouraged, um, especially my, my parents were very much into um, visual arts. So... They often, uh, weekends, when my father maybe would have a Saturday off, would go to art galleries, the small independent art galleries that were supporting young uh, painters, sculptures, you know, visual arts. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, would often tag along w with them um, and be exposed to, you know, this, this, this world. And... Um, we finally moved um, when I was tiny to a bigger house, um, and the house that we bought had a piano in it. And um, so I, my father was sort of a, a farm, a, born on a farm, and um, he, I guess it was a status thing in those days to have a piano, and he never had, had a piano in the family. So this was a, a bonus to buy this house because there was a piano in it. And I loved to play it, and um, my sister was given lessons, but she never, it never took for her. And uh, later I was given piano lessons, and I really loved it. But I was always in between. I was very, um, you know, like a lot of children, I wasn't totally, you know, focused. And especially as a teenager, I was just all over the map. I, I went to five high schools, to give you an example of my academic career. Did you get kicked out of four of them? Um, three of them I got kicked out of. <laughs> <laughs> and two of them I chose to leave. Um, so, you know, the academia world was very tough for me, but I was very creative and always in between art and music. And, yeah, so when I was later, um, you know, I'd never really finished things I was sort of would get halfway with something and then get bored with it and move to something else and um, when I was about 16 or 17 having stopped and started with a couple of piano teachers because I didn't like them and I didn't really like practicing um, I then went at it again at age 16 and I went at it a little bit too hard and that's when I did develop um, tendonitis I see. And I had a, a wonderful teacher. His name was Harry Heap. He only took about 10 students. He just lived around the corner. My mom heard about him. And I went and auditioned for him. And um, 
he was a student of somebody who was a very, very famous um, musician. Uh, I think she was from England, Mona Bates. So it was kind of a privilege to be able to study with, with he. So I went and auditioned to see if he would take me as a student, and I played Love is Blue. Remember that song? Do, 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 yeah, do, do. Yeah. It was a big hit mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm, 60s. Mm -hmm. And I think I played the theme from Romeo and Juliet. And um, I played one other poppy thing. And then I played one Bach prelude, uh, the, the very first one. And um, he said to me, you're very musical, but I don't teach that, with that other stuff that you're doing. I don't teach that. I'm, a, you know, da 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 da, and this is, if you're going to study with me, um, this is what you're going to have to do. And from there, he really formed my, my, my study habits then because um, I proceeded to study, of course, Bach, Beethoven, um, a lot of modern, more modern composers like Aaron Copland and Debussy, Ravel. And he made me from the get-go memorize um, music. So at that point, either I would just be sitting at the piano improvising and taking a piece and doing with whatever I wanted, you know, losing counts, dropping beats, you know, all over the map. Um, I had to start with very, very defined, disciplined regimen um, of working on sometimes eight pieces at a time. And memorizing each, you know, like a, let's say, twelve bars a day of each piece. So it was a it was a heavy workload, and it was discipline, which I had never really had. My parents were very loose with us, with me in particular, being the youngest. The other two were, you know, grown up. Anyway, um, he was a wonderful teacher, but I ended up, you know, damaging my hand because I finally, when I started to sort of find myself and feel like I was advancing, that's when, you know, um, this, this injury happened. And I was, um, you know, very disappointed. And, um, that, you know, it took about a year for this thing to really build up so that it was like I couldn't even, you know, pick up a cup. It, it hurt so much. So my mom took me to see some doctors, and um, they wanted to do some surgery. And my mom was like, nah, I don't think so. And um, then one of the doctors said, rest, you know. I think she just needs to not play for a while, let's say six weeks, and then let's see, it might just settle down. So I went with my cousin to San Francisco. He suggested going somewhere warm, too. It was, I think, in February, January, February. Went to San Francisco and um, found this, this club, Keystone Corners. And it happened um, that n the night that I arrived in San Francisco, that the Charles Mingus group was, was playing, performing there. And um, we went the first night and the second night and went every single night. And it was just a, an enlightening, um, you know, experience. I, at that time, even though I'd been exposed to jazz and um, my father having kind of a bit of a, a jazz collection, not big, but, you know, standard things, Count Basie, Ellington, Teddy Wilson. Um, uh, my brother had some Mingus records, so I was familiar with the name, which drew, drew me in. Uh, when I returned to Toronto after the three weeks, I had pretty much made up my mind, I want to play jazz. But I did not know how I was going to proceed in that music. I, I decided that I would finish up my piano studies, because I was going for my grade 10 piano, which was kind of the focus of, okay, finally I'm going to get something. Couldn't couldn't cut, you know, being a brownie, couldn't cut it in Girl Guides. You know, I got no badges. I've got no nothing. I want to get this certificate that says I've got my grade 10. So I did that, and then I decided I, I really want to play jazz. How am I going to do this? No universities, no, no jazz departments at the time. And um, I eventually, by another accident, found this place that was um, doing workshops, and there was a, a couple of jazz artists there that were teaching how to improvise and I just started hanging out there and I, I signed up you know for like 10 classes and I started meeting like-minded people that were into jazz and some of them were my age some of them were older adults that had you know 
jobs. I was still living at home, you know, with my, my parents. And um, going out, I started going out more to clubs and hanging out in the record stores and asking the, the guys that worked in the stores, um, who's this guy, Archie Shep? Can you put this on for me? And stuff like that. Um, now, at that point, yeah. had you picked up the flute or the soprano? Sounds? I had played um, flute in high school. And um, <coughs> I had started on the clarinet um, in, in, in um, public school. So that's like, I, they, it was a small school band. And um, uh, I auditioned, though they had, you know, they, they, the teacher who would travel around to the local little public schools to, to teach band class, um, you know, they, they would ask the kids, who wants to learn, who wants to be in the band? And I really wanted to be in the band. I really wanted the flute at first, and there was no flutes left. So they, you know, he did air training with everybody, and he wanted me to play the violin, I guess because I had a good ear. And I was like, I don't want the violin. He was like, okay, how about cello? And I was like, mm, I don't want a cello. I wanted a shiny instrument. <laughs> flute was the one I wanted most. All the flutes were gone. I think there was two. And in the end, he gave me his personal silver clarinet to play, which I played on for for grade five, grade six, and then he happened when I went to the next school for grade seven and eight, um, he was still at that school, so I used his clarinet for that. And then after, after I was finished grade eight, I was sent to a girls' private school, and there was no music, there was no create, there was nothing creative at that place, and uh, that I really rebelled. So I didn't have a clarinet, I didn't have that outlet. I mean, I loved playing in the school band as a kid. I love that feeling of practicing your part, and then all of a sudden you were playing your part, and all this was happening around you. It was just a, it was a, just a great experience, you know, as a as a child. So I love that. And um, anyhow, later, after going to many many different high schools and like five, like I said, um, I found myself in my last year of high school playing flute, which was the instrument I really wanted to play. I had a very, um, I would say, destructive music teacher, which I like to, I like to sometimes tell people about this because, um, you know, you can you can have somebody in your life that like really tries to put you down and keep you from from uh, succeeding. And and I got very good on the flute quickly because I really loved it and I was putting the time in. So this is like grade 10 and 11, I'm, I'm playing the flute. And at the end, he, 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 this teacher, he was obviously loved music too. He really um, fought to get monies from the, the school department. You know, they're always sports. It's always this fight between sports and, mm -hmm. and the arts in school for the monies. And he managed to get the monies to, you know, to take the orchestra once even to China. And he would take, the, you know, um, form the students. He had a specialty music class, which I really wanted to take, and I, he let, you know, I was allowed to take it. But this was one of these teachers who puts, he's like a, one of, we all know these kind of people that like to put their imprint on the student to say, I taught that person. It's like sports coach, mm -hmm. where you pick particular students and say, I'm going to really nurture this student along. And the rest of them can all go, you know, mm -hmm. go somewhere else. So he picked out the students that he thought were really talented and really encouraged them and really spent extra time with them. And many of them were very, very talented. It happened that this particular year that I was in, there was probably eight students that were super, super talented. And um, at the end of the year, I had decided I, I thought I wanted to be a professional musician. And so... I went, uh, he said, so what are you going to do next year? And I said, well, I think I'm going to, I want to study music. And he went, eh. He said, I don't, no, you will, you'll never be a professional musician. And I said, what do you mean? He said, because you didn't start when you were eight. And anybody who becomes, most people that become professional musicians, they, they, they start when they're eight years old. They're prodigies. And I got quite upset and I said, I started crying and I said, you can go to hell, I am so. <laughs> but anyhow, I still had that in the back of my mind. He, because all these other students were so good, and I was mediocre. And um, 
Anyhow, that's that's a whole other thing. That always really stuck in my my head for a long, long time. That I, you know, wasn't good enough and was gonna. It was always going to be hard for me. It didn't come easily. Um, and um, anyway, much later, even after winning my first Juno Award after like five, they invited students back. I'm a, I'm like in my my twenties at this point, and. Uh, yeah, I mentioned this thing about there was kind of a clubby thing that would happen on my, this is the bad part of the story, on the Monday mornings when band the orchestra practice was, and I got in the orchestra quickly too because he needed a flute. Um, I was seeing like eight in the morning these students being so chummy with him and like they'd all been partying on the weekend together mm. with the professor. No, you know where this is going, <coughs> right? It is a little, it's starting to get a little weird. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, it was like, oh man, I wish I was in that club. You know, they're all they're all love music and they're all hanging out. Blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, go back like I'm in my 20, 21, 22, and uh, I'm they're inviting students back to this to the, the the collegiate that have gone on to do interesting things with their life. I had at this point won a Juno Award from for my one of my records. And he vetoed me coming back. I found out through my art teacher there, who told my sister's friend that didn't want me coming back to the school. Mm. So this guy had it. There was something yeah. he had it out for me, you yeah. know, and uh, because I wasn't fitting the the norm of what he wanted. Anyway, a couple of years later, I'm on a plane, and you know, this was always has eaten at me. This guy and my husband you know, said, who was, what was the name of your music teacher again? And I said the name, and he opened up the newspaper, and here was this guy going to jail for... Oh, no. Yeah, oh. molesting students. Oh, wow, what a drag. Mm -hmm. yeah. On his, yeah, mm -hmm. so, I mean, it, it, this had a real bittersweet, yeah. a real bit, bittersweet thing, and, you know, maybe in some ways that was, that was, that... I was meant to have to have to, you know take the mm -hmm, the yeah. hard road and yeah. and not and and not, that's why I've always been kind of my mentors the people that they have they've always been people that I've seen like out doing it mm -hmm. and um, I took on a different um, I took on a different way of allowing myself to be mentored. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's, it's kind of weird, eh? But yeah. but it's still like you know everybody's journey is so personal, and mm -hmm. and the things that happen to you, of, of course, affect the course that you're going to take. And yeah. if I I don't know if I proceeded to kind of to push that thing, I don't know what would have happened. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to certainly I talk your about question? yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> certainly <laughs> talk about Makeke mm -hmm. and your relationship to Afro-Cuban music, which you know is a crowning achievement and an ongoing one. But before we do that, I just wanted to touch base with some of my jazz heroes and your jazz heroes who you had a chance to play with. And I'm thinking of Don Poulin, mm -hmm. Dewey Redman, Paul Blay, yeah. Billy Hart. Yeah. Um, so, so quickly, run, They're run us through. They're all so different, oh my God. But just run yeah. us through yeah. that process. Like, how did you, how did you get from yeah. uh, hanging out at you know, jam sessions in Toronto mm -hmm. to playing with these jazz players. I guess because I, I, um, I have a lot of, um, I guess I'm not afraid to be turned, like, the worst somebody, something, somebody can say to me is no. And I guess I, 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 because I'm so inspired by these these hero, musical heroes of mine, I just, that was the road that I choose that I want to understand how their, how their minds work. I want to, I, I want to, want to work alongside them to see what I can learn from that, if I can learn something from it. And it, it, I, I would never, I never, in, I was never, uh, what's the word, disappointed with all the musicians that I, really loved as musical innovators, when I got to know them, I was never disappointed with they as people because they always seemed to, their music always seemed to be them. So 
the, you know, I, I think that that cannot happen. There, there probably are some great. There have been a couple people, a couple of crazy people that I've that I've worked with. Um, brilliant, you know, genius people that that I that I saw sides of that kind of you know spooked me. That I that uh, the real dark sides. But generally, most of the musicians that I love have just become like special part of you know, like almost family and. Um, I've just learned so much from. So it was just taking that leap, you know, just of not being afraid to be turned down. I mean, when I met Dewey, I went, you know, running down into his dressing room right after the show. Like a lot of people, <laughs> maybe in this day and age, you wouldn't do that kind of thing. And uh, when, when musicians would come to Toronto, for example, James Moody and uh, uh, Frank West, and um, they would sometimes come for a three and four night run and I would go hear them night after night, and then I would say, um, you know, next night, uh, could I come, could I have a lesson with you? And so I would go to their hotel rooms uh, the next day, because a lot of the time they're, you know, watching TV or something, and to find somebody who was really eager to learn, is that, yeah, sure, come on over, and I would expect to pay, and they'd go like, forget the money, just practice the stuff I'm showing you type mm -hmm, thing, mm -hmm. you know? That you're not just wasting my time. You're going to practice this stuff, and but back to Don and Dewey and um, Billy Hart. These are all people that um, you know. You see, you meet them, and you see the just the humility that they have. Um, you know, the nights that they're playing and, and and playing incredible music, and there's like ten people in the audience. Uh, it's something that I I try and. Um, Always keep in mind because sometimes, you know, we as a band, Makeke, the girls will get somewhere and there'll be like not, um, there won't be a lot of people in the audience. Sometimes we're packed, you know, sometimes it's sold out. But, um, you know, you have to keep these, these things in um, perspective, you know, because I've seen it happen. I've, I've heard Mingus in Toronto where there was like 10 people there and they played their asses off. You know, it was just the most incredible music, and I was like, "Where is everybody? There's nobody. Uh, am I the only person here that's I've going?" I've asked that question myself. Yeah, I'm sure you yeah. have. You know, but yeah. you know, I you know, I, I look back or listen to, you know, John Coltrane at the Village Vanguard or Monk at the Five Spot or in, you know Hampton Hawes <laughs> at claps. the Lighthouse. Yeah. And it's like, wow, this Where is history, be, yeah. history being made, yeah. and there's 35 people exactly. there. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, that gives me hope that, you know, or, or it gives me an understanding that, yeah. uh, you know, musical success and the, the course of the music is mm -hmm. not related to commercial success. It's, yeah, and sure. it's uh, often it's just time, you yeah. know. Yeah. Time has to, to take its place for people to be really valued and appreciated. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's move to Cuba and uh, Mekeke. Um, you've been to the island over a hundred times and have devoted a lot, almost all of your musical career over the last couple of decades to Afro-Cuban music. So tell me how you got hooked on it, but also how you learn this music, which mm. is so complex and so African in nature. Well, not to sound like the classic, I'm still learning, but I really am still learning. There's like, there's so much. It's the same with, you know, the history of, of jazz that there's still so many names. You know, I've just, when we came in here, I was like, I don't know this guy's name. And you said, a local trombone player, Greenlee. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, oh, wow, I should know this guy. He played with R.J. Sheff. Oh, God, I'm going to check it out. But um, there's, uh, you know, in the Cuban music, my first trip there, I didn't even have any clue. I, I had, I was playing in a, in a band, getting called sometimes to play in a band, salsa band uh, in Toronto, partly because I could improvise, and the, um, everybody in the group was from somewhere else. There was not one Cuban in the group. There was a Chilean, there was someone from Colombia, I think the band leader was Colombian, someone from uh, Uruguay, someone from Argentina, someone from Peru, 
and they would bring their charts in or something that, you know, just a standard chart, and we would play it. And because being a jazz musician, I could play on the montunos, the repeated vamps and stuff, and do the solos and, and play the chart, play the chart down because I could read. But when I got to Cuba on my first trip, and it was just because of going to Mexico, getting sick, went to Cuba 82, and I started to hear this music, and like just within the first day of going there, five different styles of Cuban music within just a few hours. This was like, whoa, there was a sound that I had never heard. And then when I went into the city of Santiago and, and de Cuba and heard a couple of the folkloric groups, and I, I would hear this, this Afro-Cuban sound that was so um, much like listening to Coltrane's Africa Brass or Farrell Saunders, you know, something that Farrell Saunders would play. I would hear Af well, Afro, Afro Blue by Mongo Santa Maria is, a is actually a traditional Afro-Cuban chant. That's not an original piece. That's actually mm -hmm. a chant that he later did something with. So I, would, I heard this connection between the two musics that just were like, wow, they're, this, they're almost, they're similar. Um, but then, you know, as I started to travel the, the, the country, I realized, number one, there's regional sounds right across the whole country. And very, 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 very different. Of course, there's clave in the whole country and um, cowbells. But then because of the African diaspora and, and the different, you know, um, groups that, that, that came, you know, from the slavery times, um, there was particular languages and particular musical sounds. And there's, you know, in the eastern side, um, you hear a very strong Haitian influence, especially when you get to Guantanamo. And in Camagüey, you hear something a little different. In Havana, there's a sound, you know, there's still, because it's a big city, the Europe, certain parts of the European sound, like the dance songs and the contra danzas, these are the early classical Cuban music forms uh, from the 18th, 19th century, you start to hear like this incredible um, world of musics that so many people think Cuban music is just the one thing. So as I started traveling around with Larry, my, my husband, who's a trumpet player, um, we started to, to hear all these different musics and meet the people that were making them, and some of them the originators of the music. Um, Cachal Lopez, you know, who was, many people say he's the founder of Mambo, you know, um, and, um, the, you know, the group that he had, I, I played often with Frank Emilio, I'd go over to his house and he was the original, or he's the founder of Los Amigos with uh, Guillermo Barreto and Cachal, and uh, play with him, and I was like learning firsthand some of these descargas and how you know, how they came about, and that was one kind of thing. That was a, that was a jazz-related thing. And then I would go to some small village in Perico, um, when it was way outside of Havana, where there's a particular style of music that's not performed anywhere else except theirs, particular to Perico. And you get to, um, you know, Baracoa. There's something else different in Baracoa. So um, this just, this investigation has just been in go ongoing, the Changui, which is a music that you don't hear in Havana at all. All of a sudden now you're hearing people throwing the word around Changui and, and some of the timba groups and stuff like that because it's starting to become the fashion as rumba became uh, at one point. But now the Changui, you know, that is one of the, that's one of the indigenous musics of Cuba. And that took me like 15 years to hear. Mm-hmm had to go to Guantanamo to hear that and get deep into Guantanamo because if you just go through Guantanamo, you're not going to see anything, really. Mm -hmm. And so you have to investigate these things, have your ear on the ground, and that's been, that's been the fun. That's been the adventure yeah. It's just going into these places and speaking to people, and they know somebody. I'm going to take you to this guy. I met Pepe Sanchez in... Um, that's his little town. It's near, on the way to Santiago. I'm just doing a, a blank. But uh, he 
he eventually left for Spain and unfortunately passed away. But he was a he had a particular piano style that was like how do you call it? Um, was like uh, legend, legendary. So, mm -hmm. thank you, Jane. It's been really fascinating. We're going to continue this in part two. My name is Glenn Siegel. Thank you very much.